can start shama shall i start or shall yeah. we just wait for a few minutes no, i think no, people are just joining we'll start. Oh, okay. Start. okay uh a good evening and a warm welcome to all for intact chennai chapters program today on kalki krishnamurti I am Shama Prasanna, member of Intact Chennai chapter, representing our convener Sujata Shankar, who uh, was not going to be there, but she is still there. On, uh, we are extremely privileged to have with us today two very eminent personalities as our speakers for today, Dr. Gauri Ramnare, who will take us along with her into a fascinating insight into the brilliance of the multifaceted Tamil writer Kalki Krishnamurti. and also give us some insights into his role in the independence of india and professor prithvi datta chandra shobhi a scholar of kannada literature who will be representing who will be presenting his observations on the talk by dr gauri we welcome both of you once again for today's program before we do get started i would like to tell and share a bit about our organization intec The Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, that is INTEC, was founded in 1984 in New Delhi, with the vision to spearhead heritage awareness and conservation in India. Today, INTEC is recognized as one of the world's largest heritage organizations, with over 200 chapters across the country. It is a volunteer membership organization set up to foster awareness and appreciation of its vast, multifaceted. heritage that is of india's in the past 31 years intac has pioneered the conservation and preservation of not only just our natural and built heritage but intangible heritage as well it operates through various divisions such as architectural heritage natural heritage material heritage intangible cultural heritage heritage education and communication services crafts and community cell the different chapters across india intact heritage academy heritage tourism listing cell and library archives and documentation center intact's mission to conserve heritage is based on the belief that living in harmony with heritage enhances the quality of life and it is a duty of every citizen of india as laid down in the constitution of india intact chennai chapter regularly has online talks by eminent personalities conducts various workshops and works with heritage clubs in schools with the involvement of the young intact division you can see our programs on our youtube channel and follow us on facebook instagram and twitter if you would like to join us then email us at intactchennaichapter@gmail.com and we'd be very happy to have you as part of intact chennai chapter so now without further ado we will get on with our program and the talk on kalki krishnamurti's writing with a mission by dr gauri ramnarayan so for that i request our intact chennai chapter co convener sir divakar to formally introduce our first speaker over to you divakar thank you shama it's a real privilege to introduce dr gauri ramnarayan playwright theater director journalist who was formerly a deputy editor of the hindu now a freelance writer and translator gauri ramnarayan's work is a rare amalgam of aesthetics and scholarship as a musician she was vocal accompanist to the legendary musician bharat ratna m s subalakshmi for 16 years as in house playwright and artistic director of justice repertory Gauri uses modern techniques to evolve theater performances steeped in Indian culture, always in a global context. Her plays have been staged in major Indian cities and national festivals, and has toured the U.S., U.K., and South Asia. Her dark house with bilingual poet Arun Kolatkar for protagonist won two national awards. while nights end was selected for dramatized reading by swedish actors at a playwrights conference in stockholm nights end was also commissioned for a weeks run at soho theater london she received the nataka chudamani award for excellence in theater from the sri krishna gana sabha chennai dr gauri has authored children's books 
Abu's World, Nabu's World again, and the biography of Yamma Subbalakshmi titled Yamma's and Radha. She has translated two plays by Marathi playwright Vijay Tendulkar and Tamil short stories of Kalki Krishnamurti. Her dog house and other plays anthologizes six of her original plays in English. She served as Pepperski jury member at international film festivals in Europe. She is chairperson Rukmani Arun Devi Arundel Trust, senior associate editor of Shruti Magazine, and adjunct faculty, Asian College of Journalism, Chennai. Kalki Krishnamurti, his life and times is the latest baby. Her talk for Chennai today will focus on how Kalki's induction into writing and his pioneering work in Tamil journalism were facilitated by his involvement with the freedom struggle. We are all years the multifaceted Dr. Gaudi Chandra, Dr. Gaudi, over to you. Thank you, Divakar. Um, thank you, Shama. And of course, thank you, Sujata, all of you for inviting me to participate in this. Uh, I've always had tremendous admiration for Intac for all the work that you do and the kind of lectures that you hold and the serious um, attention that you get. And um, I'm really delighted to be a part of this, especially because I'm going to be talking about um, Kalki Krishnamurti, a writer whom I have um, virtually grown up with. I've read him from the time I was a very young child. And uh, at the age of five, my uncle used to read aloud Kalki's stories to me. Um, so it's something that I've grown up with continuously. You see Kalki, Kalki Krishnamurti, and any reader of Tamil or in Tamil Nadu will immediately respond with the words, Pony in Selvan, a five volume saga of the Imperial Choras which has stolen the hearts of uh, book lovers. The genre of historical fiction that Kalki pioneered and uh, in which he remains surpassed in Tamil still includes Shivakami in Shapatam, Parthi Ben Kanabu, novels dealing with the glorious era of the Pallava kings, Mahindra and Narasimhavarma. Today, readers hardly recall that Kalki's fascination with the past was a natural offshoot of his um, nationalistic fervor. He chose to write historical fiction because he thought that by invoking the glories of the past, he could enthuse the people of his contemporary times with self-confidence, energize them to display similar courage in fighting against the foreign British regime because this was colonial India then. You see, Kalki was one of those writers who thought that the word had the power to change the world. For such a person, writing could not be a pastime. It could not be entertainment. It could not be a ticket to fame. He was a writer with a mission. He wielded his powerful pen to promote anti, the anti-colonial struggle particularly Gandhian ideals, reformist campaigns, which were, which were a part of the freedom struggle, and the cultural renaissance that occurred during that time, which created a sense of awakening and identity for the Indian people then. With the same pen, he trounced regressive ideas, blind faith, rotting systems, and he made no bones about his intentions to promote the nationalist cause. Today, as we try to unravel the motivations of this writer's mission, let us look at how he used his talent to crusade for several causes. We can start with his own words, explaining why he adopted the strange, quaint pen name of Kalgi. The name of Lord Vishnu's final avatar, the 10th avatar, because the avatar of destruction, right? Because he says in an interview that he gave to Veera Kesari a publication in Sri Lanka on his trip, this is what he says, I took on this name to destroy regressive regimes, express radical thoughts, take readers into new directions. 
and create a new era. Look at the confidence of a young writer in those days. I don't know if any writer can dare to claim such things today. Um, to do this, Kalki R. Krishnamurti, 1899-1954, wrote not only fiction, but also poured out. He was such a prolific writer. We don't know whether he had time to sleep. Uh, political essays, reformist propaganda, travelogues, music and dance critics, uh, critiques, film reviews, biographies of Gandhiji, Rajaji, and Vivekananda, satires and lampoons, humorous essays, songs, poems, a film script or two, and, a trans and translations, including Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, My Experiments with Truth. Those political and reformist writings are hardly remembered today. Say Kalki, and the Tamil reader will immediately cry out, yes, as we already mentioned, Ponin Selvan. But that beloved saga did not emerge from a vacuum. It sprang from his political activism, his crusades for justice and equality, and a whole lot of other ideals. They expressed the humanist credo that he inherited from Mahatma Gandhi, from Nehru, from Rajaji, from Subramanya Bharati, and a score of others, Tagore, Aurobindo, you can just name them all. Also from his pride in what he saw as an eclectic culture of his native realm. Today, we are so interested in trying to narrow things down and not see them as eclectic. In those times, I think people wanted to see pluralism, plurisignification in their own cultures. He wrote novels, not to amaze or to entertain, but to provoke thought and promote values. It's interesting to see Kalki's own reaction in 1933, when a critic kind of trounced him in writing and advised Kalki to abandon propaganda and to strive for lasting literary worth. Kalki agreed and began with a glowing description of the spring season, Vasanta Kalam, in the tradition, the classic tradition of Kalidasa and all the other great poets of India. But before we know it, this lushness gives way to his announcement that Khadi, homespun, is the best wear in the spring season and indeed in all seasons. Um, and I quote, I quote Kalki, as Kalki concludes, I began with the intention of pleasing the critics, but it has ended in my trying to prove that Khadi is better than foreign Lancashire milk cloth. So expect writings of lasting literary value from the writers who appear hereafter. Let me go on in my old propagandist ways. Now, take a look at, this is tongue-in-cheek humor actually, because we do know that he left works of lasting value later. Take a look at Kalki's first published book, Sharadain Tantiram, which is Sharada's Stratagems, a collection of short stories. Each tale promotes some reformist ideal. Uh, one protests against untouchability, another satirizes the slave mentality of Indians when they see the British. Um, a third trounces the, the forcing of young girls into marriage with rich, wealthy, old men. He campaigns for prohibition, for female literacy, gender equality, though the word didn't exist then, widow remarriage, many other causes. But there is a born writer within the crusader. Each story has its own style and has rich characters. I think that I have come to, in fact, Kalki's style has acquired a special name in Tamil. It's called Kalki Tamil, Kalki's Tamil, because it's inimitable and it belongs to him, it is original. I think that I have come to believe that this writer, to this writer, I mean, it was incidental, perhaps even an unlooked for bonus, that he went on to become a celebrated novelist of modern Tamil classics and a pioneering giant of the Tamil press. Born in a poor Brahmin family in Puttamangalam village, which is in Tanjavur. In the Madras presidency of those days, Krishnamurti's education began with classes that were conducted on the front veranda by his neighbor who was a teacher and then moved on to another school in a nearby village and ended in, in a very well-known school, the National College School in Tiruchita. Uh, a brilliant academic career was cut short when he left school to answer Mahatma Gandhi's call for non-cooperation 
with the British government. This is how he describes how he was arrested for making a seditious speech against the British government at a public meeting on 24th September 1930. Quote, I was charged with having broken the order as per section 144, thereby disrupting public peace and causing distress to the people. The British ICS Duray, who presided in court, was young, I was younger. He asked the prosecuting inspector, does the accused know what sedition means? Oh yes, I squeaked. That is what I have been doing for the last year. This was his testimony. This was my testimony in court. It is true that I willfully broke the order as per section 144, but it is not true that I disrupted public peace. That would be against my dharma. It is also false to claim that I caused distress to the people. On the contrary, they listened to my speech. And as they listened to my speech, members of the audience frequently burst into loud, gleeful laughter. The head constable who testified against me just now, as a witness, he too joined in that laughter. The last sentence caused a ripple, end quote. The last sentence caused a ripple of laughter in the courtroom, but the magistrate was not in use as he passed the sentence six months rigorous imprisonment. Krishnamurti's induction into journalism was facilitated by his involvement with the freedom struggle. His career began in the patriotic journal Navashakti and in the Congress leader C. Rajagopalachari, whom we now know as Rajaji, his anti-liquor magazine called Vimochana. Very early did Rajaji become his political guru. Kalki remained his faithful lieutenant all his life, despite the fact that his allegiance to Rajaji prevented him as a writer from getting appreciation to be acclaimed, to be accepted even by people belonging to the opposing camps. Um, there is something that I want to say here because this is a question that people ask me about Kalki's allegiance to Rajaji. Uh, this was something beyond reason. Uh, Kalki was completely devoted to his um, political mentor, Guru. And whatever Rajaji said, he supported. But in private, um, we are told by Rajaji's son that he disagreed very strongly with Rajaji very often. And occasionally, Rajaji did take his word, um, did accept Kalki's counsel, but most often not. We know that Rajaji went his own way. So Rajaji, uh, but when Rajaji refused to budge, Kalki abandoned his point of view and supported him anyway. This was the dharma that he followed as a, in, in Tamil, it's very easy to understand, Talaivar and Tondan, that is the leader and his follower. So um, Rajaji became his political guru also. Now, it was when he joined SS Vasan's Ananda Vikatan, the magazine, that Kalki became a household name. Even as he made the magazine hugely successful, it's very difficult for us to understand how successful a magazine could have been in those days, especially today we have social media and you know all kinds of other ways of entertainment. In those days, it was only the magazines, right? So I, I see some parallels with the kind of fame that Charles Dickens achieved in um, London in the success that Kalki achieved in Tamil Nadu. Here, he began what was to be his lifelong practice which was the promotion of many writers of talent, women among them. In 1941, Kalki launched a magazine in his own name, Kalki, with the help and cooperation of his friend T. Sadashivam, with funds that were raised by Sadashivam's wife, Emma Subalakshmi's, taking on the role of a male, which she hated, but she did it for the magazine. She took on the role of Narada in a film called Savitri in order to raise funds for this magazine, Kalki. Though he did wield considerable influence as an opinion maker through his uh, essays and editorials, it was through his fiction that Kalki captured the hearts of the Tamils who eagerly awaited the latest installments. I believe the trains were called uh, Anandavikatan train on Thursday, I think that was the day the magazine came out. People in every village, in every village that trains passed to, every town would go and stand in a queue. Somebody was telling me about it the other day stand in a queue in order to purchase the magazine and then read it as they went home, as they walked home because they didn't want to uh, want, want the magazine to be grabbed by other family members. 
and my writer friend Lakshmi Kannan, she told me that her grandfather used to subscribe to two copies of Anand Vikram and two copies of Calculator so that he could enjoy one all for himself and let, let his family fight over the magazines as they came. This was to read particularly the novels that were of Kalki, which were serialized one after the other in, uh, in these magazines, in these two magazines. Now, um, many others also recall listening to some family elder, like a grandfather or an uncle or a mother, reading aloud with all the children and all the other younger members seated around them, reading aloud Kalki's novels. Now, Kalki had an effortless fluency, a sense of humor, and a felicitous use of language. Um, these combined to communicate his ideas in a striking and original manner. Critics have come up with a name for this original style, as I told you, that is called Kalki Tamil. All this led to a fellow writer describing him as a film star among journalists and writers, not in unmixed praise, and certainly with some envy. Kalki was not content to remain behind the desk. He was an adroit and very much sought after speaker on many subjects. He was also adept at raising funds and mobilizing resources for innumerable causes and in particularly to help educational institutions, um, the elderly, the sick, and also particularly indig indigent writers and artists. He masterminded the construction of a monument for Subramanya Bharati, our uh, Tamil poet in Ettayapuram, which was his birthplace, and also the Gandhi Mandapam in Gindi, which he personally supervised during construction. Now, um, today we call Kalki a Tamil writer, but he considered himself to be a Tamil born national writer. He was a national writer like Tagore or Premchand. At least his, his approach, his attitude was national. That is why when he launched his own weekly, Kalki, he spelled out his three goals right at the beginning in the front page, on the front page. Three, these three goals were, first, Desha Nalan, welfare of the nation. Second, Desha Nalan, welfare of the nation. And the third was also Desha Nalan. Turn into Kalki's fiction now. We can see that he was one of the very few writers who turned freedom fighters into his heroes and protagonists, particularly in his novellas. Uh, but if we look at his huge historical sagas for which he is famous today, for which people know him now, we see the same goals of freedom embedded in them, along with the liberal humanist goals and the Gandhian ideals of justice and uprightness, sacrifice and compassion. Repeatedly, you have these goals, you know, these humanist ideals, um, justice, uprightness, sacrifice, compassion. In simple words, dharma, satya, tyaga, karuna. His Parthiban Kanavar, Parthiban stream, is all about a young Chora prince who wants to achieve freedom for his, for his realm and stop paying tribute to the super monarch, the Pallava king, Narasimha Varman. You see the nationalism burning there. Shivakami in Shapatam, Shivakami's vow, is a far more complex story, though many people see it as a love story or a love tragedy, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it is packed with contradictions and ambiguities, which are the features of all literature. Um, the story itself is very simple. King Mahendra Pallava, uh, who was credited with having launched and done much of the work in Mahabalipuram, known as, uh, which in those days was known as Mahamallapuram, uh, named after his son Mahamalla, the great wrestler. Uh, the great wrestler. He was also, he was, his real name was uh, Narasimha Varman. All this you, you must be knowing. I'm just kind of recapitulating. Mahendra Pallava was a playwright himself. He was an artist. He was a scholar. And he wants to ensure peace and prosperity for his subjects and create heaven on earth with marvelous works of painting and sculpture and promote poetry and dance and you know music and all the arts. 
He's trying to prevent his valiant son, Mamala Narasimhavarman, from falling deeper in love with his coach dancer, Shivakami, while at the same time cherishing Shivakami for her excellence, fearless excellence in art. This was a time when neighboring Chalukya King Pulikesi invades the Pallava realm with a huge army. Mahindra is unprepared for war. He has never thought of building his army. He dies defending his realm and his people. The tale spins on as Shivakami is abducted by Pulikesi and then Narasimhavarman goes to prepare nine years to Um, really re re rescue Shivakami. Now she has to face her own, a different tragedy. But this is not a story of love. This is a story of war. My, as my daughter keeps on reminding me, Kalki wrote Shivakami and Shapadam during the terrible years of the Second World War. And that, because he was writing, his political writings were all about the war and they impacted on his uh, creative writing as well. And this turns the Pallava Chalukya battle into the eternal existential trauma of warfare as an eternal human reality. Also, Kalki juxtaposes the prosperity of the people, the beauties of art, the values of creativity with the brutality of the Chalukya regime, which cares for nothing but self-advancement. Compassion is pitted against cruelty, humanism against terrorism. Shivakami Shapatam is also cited very often as the single most influential literary work contributing to the renaissance of Bharatanatyam. To Kalki, the novel was a means of emphasizing the values of poetry, arts, architecture, and the learning of the entire subcontinent, which in his times was enslaved physically by the British and mentally by the people's own sense of inferiority. Through the novel, novel, Kalki tried to arouse pride and strength as India was emerge, emerging out of its dark and brainwashed stupor. Kalki's Mahindra Pallava, I have always felt, was an amalgam of the great leaders of the independence movement. Definitely he represents the Gandhian ideals. Uh, and um, he's, in fact, he's pretty close to Jawaharlal Nehru. Um, same kind of idealism. He's an artist too. He's also a dreamer like Nehru. And uncannily, Mahindra makes the same mistakes that Nehru made, he makes the same mistakes with the Chalukyas, his enemies, as Nehru made with China. They came centuries later. Kalki's neglected novel is Alay Wose. And I really urge all of you who can read Tamil to read it if you have not done so already. He considered it his best work, and I agree. It documents the turbulent decades of the freedom struggle between 1934 and 1948, ending with the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. This is seen through the eyes of ordinary people who are inevitably affected by the social political changes in any, any region at any time. The novel begins, as I said, in 1934. And as I said, Kalki was a national writer. How national he was is what we get to know in Alay Wose, because it moves from village Tamil Nadu to the cities, Madras, Bombay, Delhi, Calcutta, Karachi, Lahore, then to small towns like Devapatinam, Panipat, Haripura, and so on. Kalki wrote it as a gut-wrenching tribute to Mahatma Gandhi. But reading it today is to see something else. It is to see the Mahatma broken, disillusioned, abandoned by his closest associates, hailed as a great soul while his ideals are all forgotten. In particularly the ideal of sacrifice. In Alay Jose, you can see how Kalki's optimistic hopes for the future of India. That's where it ends with that. He says, from now onwards, now that India is free, there will be no darkness in this land. It will all be glorious and great. That's, that's how he ends it. But as you read it, as you read it, this hope kind of dissolves in the upsurge of political 
uh, disturbances and mental misgivings that the people had in those times, he cannot but fear for the future of India as the Mahatma did. The partition was yet to come, not in Alay Wose, but before the Alay, before Alay Wose, the partition was yet to come. But as a writer and journalist, he had seen enough to sense violence in the offing. At least we can sense it in his writing. And Kalki's response to, sorry, the response to Kalki's mega scale five volumes epic Pony and Selvan shows just how something as paradoxical as you find in Alay Jose, so anomalous can still happen. What we remember in Pony and Selvan, in Alay Jose, if you have read it, you remember the story, you remember the theme. In Pony and Selvan, I think we remember the characters more than uh, the actual incidents. And uh, what we remember most in Pony and Selvan are the daredevil acts and the very clever, intelligent, cunning stratagems of the protagonist hero, Mandir Devan, the soldier. In the epilogue to Pony and Selvan, Palki explains that all these flamboyant escapades and the suspenseful intrigues with which that novel is full. I mean, it's, it's a kind of a um, sandals and, you know, sword kind of, um, sorry, not sandals, but, a, you know, a kind of um, swashbuckling kind of epic. He says that those things are not really important, though he doesn't exactly say it in those words, but that's what he means, because he says that the, they are but the trimming for a novel. And what is the substance of Pony Selvan? The crux of the novel is the court scene where from army generals to merchant princes to every kind of common subject, com the, the common people, the masses, every kind of subject in the realm of the Chora kingdom, everyone wants Prince Arul Murli, the youngest Chola prince, to become the king. But, and Arul Murli is saintly uncle who is actually the legitimate heir to the throne, does not want to ascend the throne. He wants to spend his life in prayer and meditation. He wants to give up the world. But Arul Mari absolutely refuses to accept the crown, refuses to sit on the throne. Point blank, because he says that this belongs to another. He makes this sacrifice for the sake of righteousness and for justice. There may not be exact um, historical parallels or evidence to su support this view, but there is enough because Kalki is drawn very, very um, extensively from inscriptions, from all kinds of historical, uh, um, different kinds of evidence from history to write his novel. And I think to a certain extent, he was justified in uh, creating this kind of sense of honor in Prince Arumari Varman. But he did not do it just for the sake of extolling this Chora prince as someone who is um, the ancestor of the great Tamil people or the great Tamil, Tamil realm. He did it for a completely different purpose. He wanted this particular moment to be remembered by every reader, that you make your sacrifice or you choose to do what your in, inmost conscience dictates to you rather than what the world wants you to perform, even if it is an advantage for you, even if it is gainful for you. Kalki wrote his five volume sagas to highlight these values of dharma and satya, to show that the real man of valor, the true warrior is one who acts according to the dictates of his conscience. Tyaga, Kalki says, is associated with the gods and with great souls like Mahatma Gandhi. This had to be the highest value in independent India. This had to be the lodestar, the pole star, the guiding torch for India. This is what would turn earth into heaven. What the author wants and what the reader gets are always two different things. In Pony and Selvan, I don't think this is the idea that we take home. We remember the the brave, valorous acts of Vandiyadeva. Robert Frost had said that poetry, the poet, the American poet, Robert Frost, he said that poetry is about grief, sorrow, that nothing can be done about. While politics, 
is about the sorrow and grief that something can be done about. I think as a writer, Palki certainly tried to do something about both kinds of sorrows. Some sorrows about which something can be done, some redress, some improvement, some advancement, some progress, and sorrows for which you really cannot do anything about. Because we, because that, I think, highlights another quality that Kalki, as a freedom fighter, as a follower of the Mahatma, as someone who believed in the, the, the credo of the freedom struggle, as it was spelt out in those days, um, what and what was that ideal? What was that goal? What was that shining um, star that guided people at that time? It was the emotion of karuna, compassion. Because with justice, truth, and righteousness, you must have compassion. Otherwise, you be you cannot save yourself from brutality. So that karuna. It's a quality that he ends Pony and Selvan with by giving us an image. A writer does not give us lectures. He gives us images for us to interpret. And the image with which Pony and Selvan, this five volume, 3,000, 5,000 word epic ends is with Bandi Teven sitting in deep sorrow, like a statue, um, holding in his arms uh, an extremely unselfish and sweet-tempered young girl who loved him. She's dying, she dies in his arms. And Kalki ends the saga by saying that the grief, the sorrow, the compassion that Madhya Devan felt at that time transforms the rather thoughtless young man, a man of action, into a mature, into a wise and understanding and sensitive human being. Though a master at um, depicting deeply poignant and tender feelings, I think it is Kalki's humor that is remembered and loved as his most special characteristic. But humor is mostly, most of the time humor in one language is, it, it remains untranslatable. It belongs to that language. Um, so I will only say that Kalki's sense of humor delighted his readers even as it made them think, sometimes even uh, admit unpalatable truths. As a critic of the arts in particular, in which he was, he played a very important role by writing about the arts, music and dance, theater, films. He deployed this humor extremely effectively while trouncing any lack of aesthetic values. To him, lack of aesthetic values is kind of, um, to produce tacky work, to produce shoddy work. Um, he considers it almost sinful. Translating Kalki's, everything is thousand pages when it comes to Kalki, even his biography is, thousand, is a thousand pages long by MRM Sundar M. Sundar, it's a monumental work. I translated it for the last um, year and a half and it has just been released in April. Now, translating this work, made me realize not only the, this is not not only understand the story of this particular young man living at a particular time or this particular writer writing a particular language in a particular part of the world it also made me understand the struggles of india during the first half of the 20th century its political currents, the reformist movements that were rife then, the Renaissance drive in the world of the arts, the changes and changes and changes that happen in every sphere of life. I saw Kalki's contributions to all those currents of thought, all those currents of action in his political and socialist manifestos. He started as a writer of pamphlets for the Congress party. So, I saw it in his political writings, in his uh, reformist writings, in his critical analyses, which promoted the higher aesthetic values with unflinching honesty. So it functioned in so many different areas and fields. He has thought about everything. He even wrote about science and education from a layman's perspective, from an intelligent layman's perspective. And Kalki, right through his life, welcomed debates polemical disputes, some of them are very acrimonious and very and great fun to read now. 
um, and he entered into them with a kind of fearless gusto and using his brand of humor with deadly effect. But what I found most fascinating in Kalki were the two qualities, two traits with which I want to end today, which were intrinsic to Kalki as a man, as a writer, uh, as, a, as a person who wanted to bring about changes. The first is the absolute refusal to allow his political opinions to interfere with his aesthetic judgments. He vigorously opposed the principles and the credos of the rationalists and the Dravida party members, but he could hail see an another as the Bernard Shaw of Tamil Nadu. I think it astonished uh, the Dravida party members and they wrote frequently about it. He could, he could absolutely hail M. Karunanidhi's not past chief minister, his dialogues in the film Parashatti. He called them a torrent of words and verbal atom bombs. The second thing that, um, uh, that I appreciated was he refused to allow the personal to color the profession. I'll share um, an example uh, that moved me. When the noted Tamil writer Pudumai Pitan passed away, it was Kalki who raised funds to support his family of his wife and his little young girl um, to give some financial stability to them. And this despite the fact that Pudumai Pitan had all his life ceaselessly, relentlessly, very vitriolic manner attacked Kalki. However, after Pudumai Pitan's death, Kalki just buried the hatchet and this did not prevent him from raising funds for the family at all. And now I quote from my translation of Kalki's biography about this incident. Going through the poignant obituary in Kalki, the Kalki magazine, penned after her husband's demise, Udumai Pitan's wife Kamalamba wondered if she could seek help from its editor, refusing to listen to those who tried to dissuade her declaring that such a step would, should not even be thought of. Kamalamba went to meet Kalki with her child. Kalki welcomed her warmly, listened to her with sympathy, told her not to worry and promised to help. Immediately plunging into action, Kalki wrote and published a moving appeal. Along with the request for financial assistance, the appeal also contained his evaluation of Pudumai Pitan's stories. So this is how he, he writes about his arrival's uh, um, short stories. I quote, Pudumai Pitten highlighted aspects of life filled with suffering. His writings probed those aspects of society where the gangrene had already set in. Therefore, they are steeped in sorrow. Reading them is to feel anguish. We ask in a rush of anger, why does he pay attention to these things? Why does he write about them? Why does he compel us to read them? And yet, a pulse of humor runs through his writing, full of desolation as it is, and painful to read. It makes us exclaim, oh, what an insane world it is. His family is in dire straits now. Don't be taken aback by the word family and wonder how many members are there in this family. Just two souls, wife and child, in this expansive and generous land of the Tamils, in a state flooded by passion for the language. Is it impossible to enable a widow and her child to live without the fear of losing their subsistence? Is it impossible to secure the facilities of education for the daughter of a writer who shaped marvelous works of literature? Kalki 10, 6, 1951, unquote. Kamalamba made a sound investment with a sum of 10,000 that was collected, and she built a small house in Raja Annamalekuram near to where I live now, and set up a library on one side to make a library uh, for, a, for her livelihood. And I believe Kalki inaugurated that library and unveiled a portrait of Pudumai Pitan there. This event took place on 16 9, 1954, just three months before Kalki's I, I found this um, extremely moving that he could really practice what he, what he preached, that he could uh, overcome personal uh, rancor in order to do the right thing. Um, before I go, I mentioned the curious fact that the man who wrote under 13 different pen names, yes, 13, one, three names, 
left the poems and the songs that he wrote occasionally. He did not write many. He did not call himself a poet or a songster, but he did write some. And he left them anonymous. Kalki's name was not printed under any of the songs that were published in, in Kalki and Ananda Vitran, which he wrote. And uh, I wonder, I always wonder why. Uh, because what did he say in these songs? Looking at those songs of Kalki, because they're the fewest in number, a man who wrote so much, so many essays, so many tracks, so many novels, so many short stories. Uh, why did he write so few songs and poems? Uh, I think these are the songs, it is in the songs that the writer expresses his doubts, his apprehensions, his wistfulness, his yearning and his ruefulness. Though they apparently seem to be happy songs where the girl is longing for the lover or you know, somebody is waiting for a friend and happens to meet that friend. Still, it is not the happy ending or the happy situation that attracts you. It is the sorrow and the wistfulness, the poignancy that moves you. Maybe you can be poignant and tender and uh, wistful and pour out your real soul only in verse, not in prose. Um, everybody in Tamil Nadu knows this particular song, which was immortalized in the voice of M.S. Subhulakshmi. Kalki wrote a screenplay and some of the songs for the film Meera, in which she performed as the Rajasthani poetess and became a national icon. So this particular song, everybody knows. The song that wafts down the wind. And the, the, this verse is so touching for me. Nila malarnda iravinil tendral ulavidum nadil Nila niratta balakan uruvan kural udi nindran Kalamellam avan kadale yenni Uruhumo yen ulam. The young boy stands near the river playing the enchanting magical flute. Will my heart yearn for him through eternity? So this is this kind of yearning that you find in most of his songs. Again and again, Kalki returned to the image of the waves of the sea, the waves that, waves that rise like, you know, huge, turbulent, tumultuous sea and in, the, in a hurricane as they rise and fall, the sound of the waves. This, this is a recurrent imagery in his prose as well as some of his, um, at least one of his songs. Um, I don't know whether he was referring to these waves um, as the tidal swells of the subconscious of, the, of one's imagination, um, the very misty waves of imagination, that twilight zone in which we get kind of lost and which generates creativity and all prophecy and all vision and um, all the things that writers leave behind them um, for generations of people to return to and find new meanings, new interpretations, new connections, new resonances. So this is an auditory image, the image of the waves rising and falling and the sound, the resounding sound of the waves. And I want to, um, my mother told me, I think you may know that Kalki, uh, uh, Kalki Kishimuti is my grandfather. My mother is his daughter, of course. And Kalki died when he was 54. And just before he died, I believe, um, Emma Subhulakshmi came and sang some songs. And when she left, he was, still, he was still in the mood to listen to music. So he called my mother and asked her to sing um, his song from Pony and Selvan, a song that he wrote for a, a woman called Pumkureli, a woman who um, rose on the sea. You know, she's her own, a singular person. She's her own person, and um, and this, these are the these are the words that he listened to last, closed his eyes, and then he did not wake up. Um, he had a heart attack and he passed away. And uh, so we can see that as something connected to his subconscious. And the words are. Alai kadalum voindirika, ahat kadal dan pungu vadin, nila magalum tuilu gayin, ninja gandan vimu vadin. When the sea is calm, why does the heart become so tumultuous, so turbulent? While the earth sleeps, why does the heart whimper? 
I think it is the turbulent rising of the waves and the sea and the sound and the mystery and the, the mystery and the mystique of the unknown that I think generates any, any genuine lasting art. And in Kalki, we can see this associated with the waves and with the sound of the waves. It is a fact that he wrote with a mission. He wrote because he wanted to change the world through his writing. He wanted to impact on the lives of people. He wanted to provoke people into thinking for themselves because he, over and over again, he said, he, I, he quoted Voltaire, which I read when I was very young. And he, you can see that in all his writings and in the way, in, in all his actions, in his speeches, he followed this principle. I disagree with every word you say, but I will fight to my last breath your right to say it. So that kind of attitude, that doughty attitude, that, um, that liberal thinking, that plural um, vision, but yet being absolutely steady in your own principles, in your own ideas, and to write, being convinced that you can change the world through your writing. I think that's something absolutely unique to writers, many writers of the freedom struggle days. And Kalki was one of them. Thank you. I don't know if I've given any kind of uh, idea of the writer Kalki was. It's difficult to do it because he wrote so much. <laughs> and so it was so, and his writing is so diverse. So one cannot really uh, give a complete picture of the man. This I think is a personal vision, a personal response. Wow. I, I don't know what to say. This is a, you know, you've painted such a beautiful picture. Uh, you know, it's a, I think most eloquently you have spoken and taken us through the life and works of uh, KK or uh, Kalki Krishnamurti. What an interesting insight into our cultural past, actually. It's an apt way to celebrate uh, the World Heritage Day, which was on uh, 18th of April. So it just gives us a wonderful insight. And I think all of us are seeing him in a different light now. So that's, it's really wonderful. And the way you have, you know, uh, I don't know, mesmerized us with your talk, I think, Dr. Gauri, that was wonderful. Really, really wonderful. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to Dr. Prithvi giving us some of his observations. So I will uh, just ask our uh, intact member, Arya, to introduce uh, Professor Prithvi first. And then we will ask him to uh, uh, give us his observations. Thanks. Over to you, Arya. You can just unmute, yeah. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce you, sir. Prithvi Datta Chandra is a social historian, literary critic, and political commentator. He studied history and literature at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and at the University of Chicago, from where he obtained a PhD. He was also a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago, visiting fellow at the Center of the Study of Developing Societies, CSDS, Delhi, and was on the Faculty of the Humanities at the San Francisco State University. Most recently, Prithvi taught history at Karnataka State Open University, Mysore. He has also worked with the American Institute of Indian Studies and Bangalore Central University. Mr. Prithvi's research interests include the history of dissent, Indian intellectual and religious imaginations, literature and political theory. He has published widely on these themes, both in scholarly forums and popular media. At present, he is completing a manuscript entitled Hindu or Not, Anxieties of the Self and the Pol Politics of History in the Making of Veera Shaiva Lingayats, which explores the relationship between Vachana poetry and Veera Shaiva Lingayat community. He is also translating a volume of Kannada short stories of Aleph Publications, New Delhi. Prithvi has been a frequent contributor to the Indian Express, Outlook Magazine, and now writes regularly for the print.in. 
He writes extensively in Kannada and is a well-known Kannada columnist. Sir, over to you. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, this was a wonderful, moving, and extremely engaging uh, portrayal of the life, literary sensibilities, and personality of uh, Kalki. What I want to do is to take four or five minutes and make a couple of observations. Um, in some ways, I'm an interloper in this event, uh, partly because I don't study um, Tamil, modern Tamil literature or uh, pre-modern Tamil literature. Although I have scholarly interests in the fields of South Indian history, both social history and literary uh, cultural histories, spent most of my time working on Kannada uh, and Sanskrit uh, literary works uh, coming out of this region. Uh, but given the interconnections that exist between um, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, um, particularly from uh, 9th, 10th century onwards and how you know, religious and literary imaginations in these languages are uh, uh, constantly influenced by what's happening in, in other uh, regions. Um, I feel emboldened to say a couple of things. Um, I mean, I've also been uh, thinking very seriously about founding fathers of uh, Canada literary traditions were similar to Kalki in their diversity of interest, in their commitment to exploring the literary medium uh, uh, to uh, respond to their contemporary uh, um, exigencies, um, issues that they care deeply about. So uh, it's from that perspective uh, that I want to make uh, one or two brief uh, comments. Um, what, what I find quite striking as a, you know, speaking comparatively, uh, in looking at all the South Indian languages, particularly, and perhaps one can uh, include Marathi also in this conversation, uh, one can uh, see how some of these convictions that uh, uh, Dr. Gauri Ramnarayan spoke about are shared widely in among uh, uh, you know, modern writers, especially the ones who were uh, writing in the early 20th century uh, in the uh, before 1950s, uh, particularly. So uh, there's this commitment to write extensively in multiple genres, in, um, you know, there is an engagement in producing a self-confident literary sensibility, which is self-critical, right? I mean, that's the key, key thing. There's no defensiveness about one's own tradition. <laughs> and, and when, uh, you know, Dr. Ranaran talked about uh, Kalki's engagement with the past, and that's the critical thing, which, you know, becomes so important for me. Uh, it's not for the purpose of glorification that one revisits uh, the past, but it is actually to gain a sense of self-confidence uh, with which one engages with the outside world. Uh, and it was so important in the late 19th and early 20th century to do this, uh, particularly in the context of a colonial modernity, which was um, uh, so powerful, so hegemonic in a way, which could completely erase our own sense of self and self-worth. And it's, uh, it's actually the uh, field of literature predominantly, and to a certain extent, I mean, one can talk about um, other art forms like music and dance, but I feel uh, very strongly that it's literature which provides the canvas for uh, exploring and expressing this uh, self-confidence uh, for a uh, and, and to imagine future possibilities for a modern India. And it's in that context that we, um, you know, really see the significance of someone like uh, like uh, Kalki, right? And a modern India which will be more egalitarian, which will be more just and empathetic towards others in one's own society, right? So it's in that context, um, one word that I'd like to use um, is, is cosmopolitanism, right? I mean, these are extremely cosmopolitan writers. Uh, when I was struck by what uh, uh, you know, Dr. Ram Narayan uh, said about um, Kalki's own um, self-image, right, of him as being a writer who is perhaps writing in Canada, or in, in Tamil, uh, but their ambition or in their own you know, conception of their writerly self, they're global. I mean, they're not even limited by nationalist uh, you know, boundaries. So uh, it's the human condition globally which, which appeals to them and to which they're responding. And it's in that sense, right, being rooted in a place, in a tradition, but not being limited by it. And that becomes the 
marker of a cosmopolitanism that uh, you know writers like Kalki um, embody and uh, you know, uh, show such in, in, with such remarkable uh, um, uh, rigor and vigor um, in their ability to respond to global intellectual traditions and cultures, uh, learn from others, uh, but critique them simultaneously, and through that. Uh, you know, build this sense of the self, which others could also inhabit, right? And that becomes the great gift of yeah. uh, 20th century writers. So um, I'm, I'm uh, just to sort of you know bring all this together. It's this, it's this engagement with the past. It's a firm commitment to produce a humanist credo, and finally and most importantly, a life that exemplifies a particular kind of public morality, right? It's I mean, a life of sacrifice. It's not easy today to imagine, you know, any context in which one would leave one's profession, whether it's education or a you know, profession, and, and respond to a call that, uh, you know, Gandhi gave in the 19, uh, uh, early uh, 1920s or late 19, right, in 1980, 1990. So what moved uh, uh, people like Kalki or, or others in the pre modern uh, pre uh, 1947 era to respond to a you know a public context in which their sacrifice was they were not looking at it as a sacrifice they were looking at it as as a calling yeah. as you know the life's mission to build a new india right it's that kind of public morality which becomes extremely relevant for us today um, given the challenges that we are facing you know, whether it is Kalki or Subramanya Bharati or Kuempu in Canada, Appara, Takazi, Shiv Shankar Pillai, Pantalu, so on and so forth, uh, they may not have all the answers for us, but what they provide through their engagement with the world is a mode, is a model for us to fashion our own engagement with uh, outside uh, you know, cultures or traditions um, or even with our own past. And that Cosmopolitanism, right? that ability to be self-critical and create uh, a new uh, vision, a new ethos, is what I think we are uh, receiving from them as um, a gift. And that's what I want to emphasize. Uh, and this becomes so important um, as a gift for us to receive from the founding fathers of all modern Bhasha literary sensibilities. One last point on which I'd uh, like when I was really struck by uh, what uh, uh, the example that uh, Dr. Ram Narayan gave, um, uh, citing Robert Frost, and that in a sense exemplifies the difference between uh, you know the Western literary traditions and Indian literary traditions in modern era. It is this explicit uh, you know desire on on the part of Indian writers, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century or mid 20th century or even later, to engage with questions which are explicitly seen as political. And without that, there is no literature, right? There is no literary project for any of our writers. Whereas Frost or you know, other American, I mean, this is a fairly uh, uh, widely shared belief about uh, not actually looking at literature as an instrument to bring about social change. Um, and that is quite striking. And again, it's something you know, of a legacy that we would like to uh, keep and, and, and recuperate for ourselves. We end with that, and thank you so much for having uh, me today uh, and share a couple of thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take a few questions. I will take the liberty of reading out what Akila Ram Narayan has just shared with us. Just adding Dr. Fitri Shobi's current professional affiliation, he has served as Division Chair of Humanities and Social Sciences at Kriya University for the past three years, where he is an Associate Professor of History. I think you summed it up so beautifully. Um, the thoughts that um, 
I mean, really, one is not interested in an individual writer or in an individual writer's output, you know. We are thinking of linking it to the literature of your country and the world. And I think this global um, thingy, you know, I didn't dare to say it, but I always felt when I read Kalki and several other writers like Tagore, you know, all those writers of that era, Prenchan, they were not thinking of the people in their mohalla. <laughs> they were thinking of the entire world as, you know, listening to them, captive audiences. That kind of guts, that, that, that yep. it's, it's something else, you know. No, it's a legacy, which I just want to add. You know, it's a legacy that, uh, uh, I mean, even in, in the post-independence era, many Canada writers, uh, you know, have uh, uh, received and, and, and built on. Uh, because whether it's Karnad or Anant Murthy or S.L. Bhairappa, uh, whatever, you know, judgment one has about their literary uh, endeavors, they were all fiercely committed to writing in, in bhashas only, you know, all of, because all of them could have written in English. Yes. So that choice that they make, right? The choice of it's a it's an extremely political choice. It's a self conscious choice, and it's a choice to build, um, you know, a, a, a world, right? Not just a literary tradition. Yes. Yes. So there's a question you may want. Yeah, it's the question was who are his favorite writers? Um, yes, and uh, somebody wants to know how he was personally. Like what, How? Like, what was he like personally? I don't know because, uh, uh, I mean, I what if I can say something that will only be hearsay because uh, I was four years old when he died. So I, my memories of my grandfather are very vague. The only thing I remember is that he used to tell me the Ramayana. That I remember very well. I used to be, you know, sitting on his lap and then, you know, he would be telling me the story. That And I remember the gestures with which he would... Uh, uh, narrate the Ramayana. It was never just words, okay. But um, these favorite writers from it is all, again from translating the biography that I am just guessing. Uh, definitely Subramanya Bharati. I mean, there was absolutely uh, no doubt about it. He read Subramanya Bharati when he was a when he was a kid in his village. Um, they happened to read. Um, Bharati's poems, which were distributed as pamphlets first, and then they got his Sudesha Geetangal, which is his national uh, collection of his national songs. And uh, I believe Kalki used to be reciting them as he walked down the street, you know, walked to school or back or walked to the playground, whatever it is. And he, used to, he and he taught these songs to his friends, and they used to sing them loudly and you know, um, I'm sure full of cacophony um, because the boys sitting there near the river and singing Bharati songs uh, that. Kamban was another, the poet Kamban was someone whom he liked very, very much. He also liked songs of, um, Tamil songs of um, the Siddhas, um, which were kind of Ramalinga Swami Harald and Patinatar and so on. I, I, I go by his quotations, but it's very difficult to guess Kalki's favorite writers because if you read his books, they are full of quotations from any number of sources, you know, and uh, including um, Buddhist prayers, in Tamil, in Nage Patana Churamani Viharam, uh, prayers that were said for the welfare of uh, one of the Chora kings during that time by the Buddhist monks. So that, he quotes that also. So he was a voracious reader. Apparently, he loved Pichi Wodaus. He loved all the humorous He enjoyed reading Punch, the, the magazine. He loved Punch. And I think his one, he frequently talks about Victor Hugo. He really loved Victor Hugo and he thought he keeps quoting uh, Victor Hugo for that uh, extraordinary ability of the bishop to be, to forget that the man whom he is helping is not, is not a good man. <laughs> so that is, um, so I can't really um, remember uh, any, uh, all the great Tamil writers, that's for sure. I think he likes Shakespeare too because he has written about Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 please. Has uh, Kalki uh, visited Mamallapuram and the Tanjur Big Temple? Has he read South Indian inscriptions? Which is all about Mamallapuram inscriptions and 
Rajaraja Chola inscriptions at the Tanju Temple. Because uh, his earlier novel, Swagamin Sabadam, is about the Pallavas. Yes. And um, Punim Chalun, obviously, is about the Chola yes. dynasty. Yes. Yes. And I also understand that he has had a recourse to epigraphy uh, to, in fact, uh, evolve his uh, historical fiction on these areas. Has yes. he visited these two places, Mamalapuram? He has and visited a lot of places. In fact, he took extensive tours along with his illustrators and the cameraman. The cameraman, you'll be really amused to know, uh, was usually um, Elizar Dungan, the American from Ohio who settled in Chennai for a long period of time and made uh, Tamil films. He directed Tamil films, including Mira. Means Mira, including Mira. He directed a whole lot of films, a whole lot of Tamil actors of those times, okay? He was a famous film director, an American who settled in Chennai for a period of time and directed Tamil and Telugu films also. Uh, so uh, he, uh, Dangan used to go with him, Elizar Dangan used to go with him to take photos. There, there are photographs of Dangan, Kalki, and the illustrator Maniam or Chandira. These were the two illustrators in, who worked for, with Kalki. So they used to travel and they've gone to uh, Ajanta before writing um, about uh, writing Shivagami and Shapatam. Of course, to Mamalapuram many times. I, and he's written a story, he's written a travelogue about going to Mamalapuram. I believe they went by boat. <laughs> yes, this is hard to go yes. by boat uh, uh, through yes. Buckingham Canal. Yes, all we have it yes. is also there in Epigraphia Indica, uh, which yes. was edited by Hulsh in collaboration with V. Venkaya, the first Indian epigraphist. Yes, uh, yes, Akalki has read a whole lot of. Uh, I believe he had a box, a trunk full of books, history books in English and in Tamil. Uh, which he used to refer to uh, whenever he was uh, writing his historical novel. But of course, he must have read them um, very in intently before starting to write. And um, uh, uh, he, uh, he also, he, he did not read inscriptions, but he did read about inscriptions. And there is a reference to the Anbil Sepedgal in his um, a whole chapter on it. In, uh, so epigraphical details are uh, part <laughs> of it. extensively that. about them in his novels. Yeah. Epigraphy yes. includes uh, Chepedu also, inscription yes. on stone, as lithic records, as well as on metals, the copper yes. plate. Yes. Um, they're all, uh, in fact, proclamations or documents. Um, yes. So that is it. Are there photographs uh, of Kalki having visited Mamalapuram and Tanjur uh, temple? He, Tanjavur was his, his uh, stamping ground. He was born in uh, Kutamangalam. So, you know, I mean, that uh, Tanjavur area, he would know very well. He visited a lot of places in order to write. That I know for sure. Uh, in fact, there was a talk given by um, Tangam Tengarasu, who is now, uh, now one of the ministers in the DMK government right now, uh, about the places that Kalki, historical places that Kalki had visited and written about, including um, um, a Nirari Mandapam or a, a kind of a, a stone mandap in the middle of a lake, uh, which he had identified. He, had, he, he himself had followed this trail and identified, and uh, he gave a wonderful talk on that. Kalki's historical research. So, Tangam Tenerasi is the man to ask. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Go press the bell. I will take the honor of proposing the voters thanks. First of all, Dr. Gaudi, thank you so much for your time and for such an engaging talk like you always do. Professor, thank you so much for your time and thank you for, just as somebody has said in the chat box, uh, Dr. Prithvi Shobhi's summing up was as striking and arresting as Dr. Ram Narayan's talk. Um, I think this sums up what I wanted to tell you. Uh, thank you so much. We all know um, Kalki as 
the legendary writer but what what we saw today or what we heard today rather was um the multi shades that he has explored as a writer and how how i if i if i may how he has um excelled in every genre of writing that he has uh, set his pen on thank you all for your time and on behalf of intact i would like to um inform you about our next talk um uh, just give me a minute i would like to our next talk in collaboration with iit chennai details will be up on our instagram and facebook pages very soon you may all please go to our instagram and facebook handles and look for further details this is on the 27th of april which is the coming wednesday from 6:30 to 8 pm india time we look forward to hosting you there thank you all for today and thank you for attending this talk